Easter Sunday. Hi everyone, happy Easter, good to see you this morning. We're going to really be celebrating the Lord in this place today. So I hope you've come with your best voice this morning. If you've got dancing shoes, we hope you've got them on as well this morning. I can see one person already ready for that. We're here to celebrate the Lord. He is risen. Hallelujah. Come on. He is risen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give him praise right now. Yes, he is risen. Come on, somebody, put your hands together and praise the Lord. So once again, welcome, shall I say, family of God, because we are the family of God. We are going to be in eternity forever together, praising the Lord. So we might as well do it together this morning with joy. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And he says, come to him with gladness this morning and enter his gates with thanksgiving. So we have something really to be thankful for this morning. We are thankful that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has risen. Amen. Hallelujah. My scripture, 1 Peter 1 uh, 1 1, verse 3, it says, All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Yes, hallelujah. Now we live with great expectation yes. and we have a priceless inheritance. Yes. Wow. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Yes. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Amen. How amazing is that? The resurrection. He has saved us. He has set us free. Let us praise him together this morning. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that Jesus is alive. We thank you, Lord, that not only is Jesus alive, but he is seated at the right hand of God the Father, forever interceding for us. We have one who is familiar with everything that we go through and loves us and accepts us and wants to give us his best and wants to bring breakthrough into our lives and wants to bring his overflow into our lives. So Lord, on this Easter Sunday morning, we say, Lord, our hearts are ready to worship. Our minds are ready to receive your word a bit later on in the service. Lord, we want to lift the roof of this place with our praises to you, our most excellent Lord and Saviour. Jesus Christ. We love you. We love you. We love you. Let's give him praise. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise the Lord, everyone. Well, we're going to get into worship. We're going to invite you to stand in a moment. And um, our worship team is really excited. They've chosen some amazing songs for this morning. And would you welcome the worship team. Ruby will be leading the team this morning as we lift our voices to the Lord. So if you're able, I invite you to stand with us as we worship. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance 
sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Sting. The angels roared for Christ the King. Oh, praise the name! Oh, praise! Oh, praise the name of the Lord! Sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. He shall return, he shall return in robes of white. Sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Come on, people of God, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord.
to the depths of the sea. Creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind because I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want
the mountain again. We're going to sing that just now. But I want us just to take a moment and just reflect on what Jesus has done for you personally this morning. Each one of you are here because Jesus loves you. He loves you. If you just look at creation, you can see the beauty and the wonder of our Creator, our Father, our King. And He sent His Son, Jesus, to set us free this morning. No matter what you're going through this morning, no matter where you are this morning, Jesus loves you. He wants you to know that He loves you with an everlasting love. The Father has sent His Son to set you free. And if you need freedom this morning, you just need to surrender and say, I'm free this morning. The Lord wants you to be free this morning, free to worship Him in spirit and in truth. He's a loving Father. If there was just for one person he died, he would have done it. But he done it for all of us. He done it for me. Can you say that this morning? Thank you for dying for me. And all you need to do is say, Lord, I receive you as my Savior. Thank you for dying for me. A sinner. But you have set me free. Jesus comes to set us free so we can have an abundant life in him. And he wants each and every one of us to have an abundant life in him. And we were going to sing that song. Maybe you've got a family member or a friend who you know is far away from Jesus and their life just doesn't look like it's in a good place. Can you speak Jesus over them this morning? We were talking about faith. God raised mighty men and women up of faith. That's why we are here this morning. Someone prayed for you. Someone trusted the Lord for your salvation. He's come for every generation, from the youngest to the oldest. Who are you praying for this morning? Do you want to pray for your friends this morning? Lord, we pray for our friends and our family who don't know you. We pray, Holy Spirit, would you be the one that lights their eyes and their hearts up again. It takes a hardened heart and removes a hard heart and give them a heart of flesh to understand your salvation. Lord, we pray for our friends and family who don't know you yet. Lord, may they come to know you. Is there someone you want to put before the Lord, before Jesus this morning and say, thank you, Jesus, for their salvation. We thank you, Jesus, for dying for them this morning. I thank you, Jesus, for my lost family members. I thank you, Jesus, that they will receive salvation and they will inherit eternal life. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for all of us. Let us go and be with him forever. We want to take as many people with us. We want to take our family, our friends with us. We want to take our neighbors with us. It's time for the church to arise and start praying. Praying every day as you walk down the street, you pray for your neighbor. You pray for the person at the checkout. You pray for the person in the, the queue behind you. You pray for that moody driver that has lost all the hope. You don't know what's going on in their life. Pray for their salvation. So, Lord, we want to speak Jesus. And, Lord, we want to speak Jesus over our broken world right now. Let's just pray Jesus. All over the world, there's conflict. Lord, we pray, we speak Jesus. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the Middle East. And, Lord, wherever there's conflict, we ask, Lord, would you be Jesus in the midst of that conflict? Would you save souls, Lord, to receive you, those on their deathbed? May you reveal yourself to them right now in Jesus' name. You may even know someone who's close to death. Pray that Jesus reveals himself to them that they receive him as Savior. Let's just sing that song and speak that over your world right now in Jesus' name. From Shout, from, shout Jesus from the mountaintop. Shout, shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the street. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I 
speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, yeah, I'll shout Jesus, shout Jesus, shout Jesus, Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over. Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Hallelujah So what's ever going on in your life? may be seated. God is aware. He sees everything. He knows everything. And he loves you. And he cares for you. And not only does he have breakthrough for every single one of us, but there's overflow. Overflow. Overflow of his grace. Overflow of his goodness. Overflow of his mercy. Mark chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away? from the entrance of the tomb. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Do not be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go to the disciples and Peter. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Welcome to our Easter service. It's good to have you all with us today. I trust that you are able to exalt and lift up the name of the Lord and worship him. And isn't the Lord so good? When we praise him, I like to always put it this way. When the praises go up, the blessings come down. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. You know, whatever we're going through, we can have a great day or we can have not such a great day. However we feel, when we make that decision to put on the garment of praise, even if we feel a bit heavy, might walk in with a bit of a spirit of heaviness. But the moment we decide to put on that garment of praise for that spirit of heaviness, the praises go up and the blessing comes down and the overflow comes down. Praise is always a decision. Praise is always a decision. I'd encourage you, if you want to find out more about praise being a decision, online is our last Sunday's Palm Sunday. What a week it's been, Holy Week. Palm Sunday service. Listen to it. And you will see throughout history and even in archaeology how rocks have cried out to praise the name of the Lord. All scientifically proven. You can listen to that sermon. For those who had Covenant Thursday in their life groups, We know we had a really blessed time. Anybody have a blessed time in your life group or a small group this week as we gathered around communion and just that precious moment where we thought of the Lord and his last supper. 
actually his last supper before the new covenant. His last supper before the resurrection. It wasn't his last supper. It was just the last supper before the resurrection. What a service Good Friday was. It was a Good Friday service like no other. YouTube was down that morning. We couldn't get the service up, but our tech team rose to the occasion, recorded the service, and the moment YouTube was open for us, it's on there. So again, if you missed Good Friday, there's a sermon there for you. This morning, we're going to see something awesome from Scripture. And my prayer is that God would revive every single one of us here and bring a global revival to His church. Before we do that, once again, welcome. If you're visiting us for the first time, a really, really big welcome to you. If you want to find out more about the church, we have a little green card in the foyer. You can fill that in and you can get onto our mailing list. If you're not yet a member of the church and you would like to be a member, speak to me. We'd love to speak to you about membership and what it means to be part of this awesome family here at Buckhurst Hill Baptist Church. And wherever you've traveled from this morning, welcome. Welcome to those joining us online. Great to have you with us, and hopefully we'll see you in person very soon. Isabel, you've got a few notices quickly to run through. Do you want me to do them? I'll do them, seeing I'm up here. And then, Tony, straight after me, it's over to you. So, tech team, work with me. Our first notice is ta-da, the coffee morning. Great. For those of us who can make a Thursday morning coffee morning, it's always great, and our conversations always center around the Lord. Well, coffee mornings are in recess at the moment and will open the first Thursday after the school holidays. I think it's the 18th of April, somewhere around there. Next. Life groups. Well, life groups is a place where you connect with people. It becomes your community. I believe the church grows bigger and smaller at the same time. We grow bigger in number here on a Sunday, and Sunday becomes celebration services where we come to exalt the Lord and you receive teaching from the Word of God that will equip you for the week that lies ahead. I always say this, I don't preach for a Sunday. That's why I always say stay awake. I preach for your Monday. Because right now, you know that you're going to need a word from God somewhere in your week to get you through, to lift you up so that he's overflow. So I always preach for a Monday, although Sunday's the day you get the download for the Monday. You Life groups then meet during the week, almost every day of the week. And they rediscuss the word from Sunday, see how it applies. They worship together and pray together, support each other pastorally, as well as thinking about who we can reach out to as a church. Life groups. Again, on recess, but straight after the holidays, they are all back. I want to see some multiplication of life groups in Jesus' name. All right, next one. FNY, Friday Night Youth. Friday Night Youth is also in recess at the moment and says Kids Church, but straight off the holidays, we are all back. Uh, I think the 19th is the first Friday night back at 7 o'clock for high school aged young people. And then the 21st, Sunday the 21st, the kids ministry is back. For now, we are all together. This is like one big dining room table at Granny and Grandpa's house. Everyone's invited, you know, and you know, if the kids make a noise, they're meant to make a noise. If the babies cry, they're meant to cry. If you fall asleep, you're not meant to do that. You might choke on the broccoli, okay? So stay awake. We're going to have an awesome service. Over to Tony, our treasurer. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, just uh, here to remind you about uh, your regular tithes and offerings particularly today, yes, uh, Jesus is risen, hallelujah, and uh, Ephesians 1 tells us that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the Father is at work in the life of every one of us who believes today, so that power is available to us, it, it is also, Jesus' resurrection is also our guarantee of eternal life, so on this day in particular in the Christian calendar, we have much to thank our Father for. So as part of our thanks and our worship, can I remind you to uh, give via the usual means. You can give via the website. If you want to pay by card, see me afterwards uh, in the Welcome Centre. I'll have the card reader with me. 
So uh, let's offer these on this, this particular day. Let's, in um, uh, an attitude of thanksgiving uh, to God, let's offer our gifts to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are overawed by all that you do and have done for us. Father, we just want to worship you today and we pray that you'll accept our gifts uh, today of all days. Father, use them, grow them, bless them and expand your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if the worship team could come on up, we're going to sing a song just before we get into the word. Carol's got a word from the Lord. I believe, I believe it's a prophetic word. Um, um, uh, stand and practice. If you believe you've got something from the Lord, bring it to me. We'll check it out. As Carol started speaking, I just said, don't speak anymore. Speak to the church. It really is from God. Okay, so bring it, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, as we were singing, you know, I just want to speak the name of Jesus. I had this picture uh, of someone standing and all around them looked like desolation destruction there was nothing everything looked just dead this person just stood so despondent among what looked like destruction uh, and, and nothing there just everything was dead it looked dead to them but in the middle of it there was this little seed growing and as I looked at it it just grew and grew and grew till the whole thing just burst into life and Jesus wants to say to that person, I'm going to bring life. I'm going to bring life into your destruction. I'm going to bring life into your desolation. I am going to bring you life. And, you know, it's Resurrection Sunday, you know, hallelujah. It's, you know, amazing. You know, God wants to bring life, new life to you. And there is no more destruction. It's all gone. It's all gone. It's all new, new life. Thank you, Carol. Before you disappear, let's pray. Let's pray. Yes, let's give the Lord praise. That's great. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> And there's a scripture that says the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Well, we don't want the epic forest clapping louder than God's people this morning, do we? So let's pray. Lord, wherever that word is for, it might be for more than one person, maybe for someone here, maybe someone joining us online. Lord, we speak your breakthrough, we speak your love, we speak your overflow of your goodness and your good plans that you have for them. We bind the enemy in Jesus' name. We know what is bound on earth is bound in heaven. What is loosened on earth is loosened in heaven. So the evil one, every evil plan, every curse over that person or persons is broken now in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray for the release of the love, the person of Jesus, and the power and person of the Holy Spirit into their lives. In the name of our Lord, we pray. And thank you for Carol, Lord, who brought this word. I pray, Lord, that you would just fill her now to overflowing with your goodness, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Worship team.
Father, as we gather around your word now, I just come up against every distraction. I pray our minds would be alert, we'd be attentive, we'd receive what you want to say to us today. Lord, that we'd receive your word, that your word would bring life, bring breakthrough, bring overflow. Let your goodness be poured out in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you ready? Resurrection Sunday sermon. Wow. Every year, thousands of people travel to the Italian Alps to ascend a mountain which passes through what they call the Stations of the Cross. Eventually, they come to an outdoor crucifix. And there, those who are religious will stand by and just absorb the moment and reflect on their faith. One day, a tourist, a BDI tourist, noticed a trail that led beyond the cross. Determined to find out where this trail led, he started his own little mini expedition. And this trail was covered over, grown over with thickets and bushes and all that kind of thing. But he eventually found a path. And he found a path to another shrine. This shrine symbolized the empty tomb. But when the bushes had grown up around it, it had been neglected. Almost every visitor passed through and who has passed through has gone to the cross, but there they've stopped. May I put it to you, you may be a good Christian, you may go to a good Bible-believing church that believes in the Bible and preaches the Bible, you may believe in Jesus, but very often what we do is we stop at the cross. Not to diminish the cross because we would never do that, because we say that there's power in the cross. But if Jesus had not risen from the grave, what would have happened then is that it would have been as good as you or me dying on that cross. Could you take my mic slightly down to get rid of the feedback? Thanks very much. Sound team's doing a great job. 
the power comes in. The power is activated in the resurrection. In the resurrection. And that's the focus I want to draw to today. Is that let's step now beyond the cross and see the cross through the eyes of the resurrection. See the cross through the eyes of the empty tomb. After all, the great apostle Paul spoke a bit about this. He said this in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 7. 15 verse 7, he said, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. That's 1 Corinthians 15 7. So the resurrection is not just the survival of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is not just his resuscitation. You see, God performed a dramatic act by which he arrested the process of decay and corruption and decomposition. He rescued Jesus from the realm of death and transformed his body into the glorious, glorified body, immortal to live forever. What exactly is the resurrection? Well, the resurrection of Jesus was he was dead, but now he is alive. Come on, somebody say amen. And it's precisely at this point that the New Testament in Revelation speaks into it. Look at Revelation 1 verse 18. Jesus speaking. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Come on, people. Somebody give him some praise in the house. Jesus speaking himself to John on the Isle of Patmos saying, I am alive forever and ever. Just in case you didn't get the first forever, he adds an extra ever. Just in case you don't realize how long eternity is. Come on, someone. So why should anyone consider it impossible that God raises the dead? That's the question I want to answer today. Why is it that anyone should consider it impossible that God raises the dead? Today, I want to take you to AD 60. It's 30 years since Jesus rose from the dead. The book of Acts is still being written. And we find ourselves in Acts chapter 26. We find ourselves here in Acts chapter 26. And the place is a Roman court in Caesarea, on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. It sounds lovely, hey? Anybody going on holiday to the shores of the Mediterranean Sea? The only thing is this was not Club Med. This was a courtroom. Paul had been hauled into a courtroom. He had accusations against him. He had been going around preaching that Jesus is risen from the dead. Everywhere he went, he went on his missionary journeys. He went all around planting churches. And what was his message? Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. They're telling you he's dead, but I'm telling you Jesus is alive. Do you believe it in this row this morning? Jesus is alive. The back row believes it. This other back row believes it. Second from the back, middle, 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 front row. Come on. He's alive. But you see, ever since the resurrection, Ever since the resurrection, it brought trouble for Christianity. Right from the book of Acts, we're in Acts this morning, chapter 4, that's right at the beginning, directly after the day of Pentecost. The religious leaders wanted to clamp down on the Christians, and they persecuted the Christians because they preached the resurrection. Yeah, Paul finds himself in court. He's in big trouble. There are those who have murderous thoughts against him. We need to kill this Paul because we need to kill off the message that Jesus is risen. We need to wipe the church off the face of the earth. Why is the devil so nervous about the resurrection? Why does the devil hate the resurrection so? Because the resurrection spells defeat for the devil. Quick spelling lesson this morning. Resurrection spells defeat for the devil. You know, Tony quoted it in the offering talk. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. That same resurrection power that raised him from the dead, that moved that stone out of the way, lives in each and every single one of us. So the year's AD 60. Paul's in this court along the Mediterranean Sea, 
He doesn't have one judge. He's got two judges. Isn't that great? I mean, one judge is bad enough, but imagine two. He has Festus as a judge. Festus is a Roman judge, and he's got into a muddle. He's in a big pickle. He doesn't understand any of this. So he calls in for some backup. He gets King Agrippa. Now, King Agrippa, you could say, because of his Jewish links, was the Jewish judge. Now he stands before them. He's not just standing before them. He's been under arrest, in prison and in house arrest, and he's standing before Agrippa in chains. Big deal, you say. Agrippa sounds like, you know, a foreign name. What does that mean? Well, Agrippa, if you know your Bible history, was the great-grandson of Herod the Great. Who was Herod the Great? Herod the Great was the one who ordered the death of baby boys in Bethlehem when Jesus was born because he wanted to wipe out the Messiah. So this is where Paul finds himself, 30 years after the resurrection. He's been now preaching. Remember, he had the road to Damascus experience. Jesus appeared to him. He's been preaching the resurrected Savior, but now he's in deep trouble. They want to end his life. They want to wipe Christianity off the face of the earth. Paul's case has been referred to Agrippa by Festus. We can't understand what's going on here. With his Roman background, he just cannot comprehend why the Jews of that time hated Paul and why Paul kept talking what the Bible says. He kept talking about the following. A dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed to be alive. A dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed to be alive. There, in that one sentence, is the problem of Easter. Paul believed it. The Jews didn't believe it, and the Romans didn't understand it. Isn't it the same in today's world? If you've been born again, given your life to Jesus, we understand it. We've got a revelation through Scripture from the Holy Spirit that He is alive. Others around us might not understand it, and some want us to shut up, keep quiet, you know, You know, talk about everything else. You can talk about the crucifixion. That's okay. You can talk about the horrific scourging. You can talk about the crown of thorns on his head. But don't talk about the resurrection. It makes the devil really nervous. It freaks out the religious bunch. And those who love Jesus say, yes, we're going to be raised one day as well and get glorified bodies. The Jews said Jesus was dead. Paul said, no, he's alive. And old Festus doesn't have a clue. They were listening to this man named Paul whose crime was that he preached the resurrection. His sermons declared that Jesus was alive and they wanted him dead for that. This still goes on in the world today. We know people who we mentor in ministry and support in ministry in different parts of the world. Where they gather like this You can be dragged outside, beaten into an inch of your life, and thrown in prison. But they get louder and louder and louder. Every time the persecution comes, they sing a little louder. Every time they tell them to keep quiet, they preach a little louder. You see, the devil doesn't like volume. The volume of the church is a powerful thing. When we sing praises out here on a Sunday, we're not the cheerleading squad. Jesus doesn't need cheerleaders, right? Jesus wants praises. In fact, he said to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, a time is coming and now is, now is, where true worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. So yeah, we find ourselves in a court case in Acts chapter 26. It will come up on the screen. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself, as if Paul ever needed permission to speak. And if your name's Paul here today, you must feel especially welcome to church. So Paul (laughs) motioned his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today. What a Christian. He's got boldness. He doesn't say, oh, mighty king, oh, forgive me. I just had this idea because I saw Jesus. Then, oh, please. No, well, it's awesome to talk to you today, king, because I know who I am in Christ. I'm anointed, I'm appointed. My life has never been the same again. That's what he's saying. As I make my defense against the accusations of the Jews. Now, very carefully, I have to add a footnote. Paul is not being anti-Semitic. 
Paul was a Jew himself. Paul loved the Jewish people, but there were Jewish leaders that had come up against him. So in saying this about the Jews, please note, there's no anti-Semitism, yeah? Paul was a Jew, he loved the Jews, but his own people, the Jews, some of them, he's not speaking about all Jews universally, but some of the Jewish leaders had turned against him and wanted him dead. So you, you've got that, don't you? Somebody say, yes, we've got that, okay? So the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. You know, when a pastor says, listen to me patiently, it means going to be a long sermon. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They've known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of our Jewish religion, living as a Pharisee. So he was the all-time Pharisee. If you wanted a Dictionary definition of Pharisee, it will say Saul of Tarsus. That was Paul before he came Paul. Yeah, you with me? And now, it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise of our 12 tribes and hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of the hope that these Jews are accusing me. It is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? That's what we're answering this morning. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? Now, that word incredible isn't often how we use it. I mean, if we like something or are amazed, we say, oh, that's incredible. Who does that? I do that. But this incredible in the Greek means against belief. Impossible. Why are you saying that it is impossible that God raises the dead? That's what he's asking the judges. Why are you saying it's impossible that God raises the dead? And Paul goes on in his defense. He says he used to be a skeptic. He said he used to be skeptical about Jesus. In fact, he persecuted the believers. In fact, he was in favor of killing the Christians, the early Christians. He wanted to see the church wiped off the planet. But historically, something changed in his life. He is on trial and he's now asking the question, why does it sound impossible to you that God raises the dead. Very anointed, very clever. The Holy Spirit was obviously giving him wisdom, yeah, and Paul was a clever man as well. What's he doing? What is he doing? First of all, he's saying the resurrection is philosophically credible. The resurrection is philosophically possible. It's, he's saying it's not unreasonable to say that God raised Jesus from the dead. So he appeal, appeals to philosophy. Look at Acts chapter 26 verse 8. He says, why should any of you consider it incredible, impossible that God raises the dead? Do you see the name Jesus anywhere there? No. He starts with God. For the time being, he's now keeping quiet about Jesus, but nothing about his life is quiet about Jesus because he's coming to a philosophical level. He knows that Agrippa, would have believed in God of the Old Testament, the God of the Old Testament. He would have known that Agrippa, so he's appealing to the philosophical nature of Agrippa. He says, this God that you believe from the Old Testament, are you saying now he's powerless? Surely you knew that he opened the waters for the Israelites to go through. He rained down manna from heaven. He took down the water spirits that they believed, looked after and protected the family. Of course, us Christians don't believe that, but this is exactly what Paul is doing. He is coming onto philosophical, whatever you call your God, know this, that the one true God raises the dead. So Paul is appealing to both of these people and saying, it is God who raised the dead. That was his introduction. Then he turns up the heat. Isn't that how things work in the church? And in Christianity. You know, a nice little introduction. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you. And then the heat gets turned on. Wow, the Holy Spirit comes. 
He moves from philosophy to theology. Wow. He moves from philosophy to theology. Let's look at these verses again, Acts 26, 6. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. See, I'm just on a, a gripper. You, you've believed all of this. All the stuff was promised all through the Bible, all through the scriptures that you hold dear. Every Jewish leader, every Pharisee would have held dear to those scriptures. And he's saying, all I'm talking about is what God promised. And then look at verses 22 and 23. But God has helped me to this day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. He's saying he wants everyone to hear this message. I may be in court, he's saying, but actually I'm preaching. I'm using the courtroom as my pulpit today for everyone who will ever read about the small and great alike. This is what he's saying. I'm saying nothing beyond the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead. He doesn't keep quiet about it. Though. He's about to die for saying this. So he just says it again. As those about to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his people and to the Gentiles. Paul is saying the resurrection is theologically possible. It's not blasphemy. It's possible because of God. Paul is simply saying there was promises, there were promises made in the Old Testament. The prophets prophesied it. Moses talked about it. Agrippa, what's wrong with you? You should be believing this. You should be saying, amen, preach it, brother. But Agrippa, let's consider this. Let's look at the theological facts right here. You know that the story of Jesus saturates the entire Bible from beginning to end? Jesus is on every page. Conservatively speaking, now conservatively speaking, the Old Testament contains 300 prophecies about Jesus. That's a conservative estimate. There are plenty more, which Jesus fulfilled them all. So this is what he's saying to Agrippa, and of course Festus, who doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. That is all there. You've believed it all your life. You've been taught this in the synagogue. You know, as I said, the Bible's full of messianic prophecies. A mathematician by the name of Peter Stoner counted the probability of one person fulfilling a small amount of the 300 prophecies. Let's just say there's 300. So this mathematician said, all right, let's just say 48 people, not 48 people, 48 prophecies. Let's say that a person was able to fulfill 48 out of 300. I mean, that's a pretty low score, don't you think? 48 out of 300. You're a teacher and your student got 48 out of 300 and there's no mark scheme that's going to boost them. They're in deep trouble. So let's just say 48 out of 300. This mathematician worked the following out. Just 48, if one person fulfilled just 48 of the prophecies found in the Old Testament, he concluded that would be one, the chance would be one in 10, followed by 157 zeros. So if one person, the chances of one person fulfilling just 48 out of 300 prophecies, the chances are one in 10. And that 10, if you're a mathematician, tell me what the number is after the service, please. 157 zeros. Paul, in a courtroom in AD 60, was saying that the resurrection is philosophically possible and it's theologically possible. Next, he says, it's historically credible. Acts 26, 24. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. I mean, now, here's the guy that understands nothing about this, decides to interrupt. Don't you just love that? You're planning something and somebody who knows nothing about what you're talking about comes up with a bright idea and you look, what planet did you just fall off? So this is what Festus is doing. He says, you are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. I mean, imagine this in a court proceedings. You are out of your mind, exclamation mark. Your great learning is driving you insane. Look how Paul responds. What a good Christian guy. 
I am not insane, most excellent Festus. He didn't say, you stupid, da 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 da. He said, O oh, most excellent Festus, I am not insane. Paul replied, What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things. Oh, now he's putting a gripper on the spot. He's putting him in deep water with Paul himself. Do you see that? He's saying, the guy next to you, who you got in from some help, knows exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, he's governor over this province where it all happened. And he saw it all happen. So he knows exactly what I'm talking about. And look at verse 26, uh, 28 there. Acts 26, 28. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you could persuade me to be a Christian? What do you think is going on there? The Holy Spirit was ministering to those judges. They felt persuaded to be a Christian. Acts 26, 4 and 5. The Jewish people all know the way I've lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and I can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. He appeals to his historical record and what people know about him. He said, you can bring them in as witnesses and they can tell you that this is all true. And then almost lastly, he says, it's also personally credible. Acts 26, verses 8 and 9. Why should any of you consider it impossible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus. Paul used to give the go-ahead for Christians who preached Jesus to be tortured. But something changed. Something personally happened to him. And friends, you know it, when something changes on the inside of you, when something personally happens with you, because you have an encounter with a resurrected Savior, there's no demon, there's no force in hell, there's no force on earth, there's no person that can keep you down because your life has been eternally forever changed. Am I talking to anyone like that here this morning? Then let me hear. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Acts 26, 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? And I puts the guy on the spot again. Do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Verse 29. Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. What's Paul saying here? What's Paul saying? Become as I am, except for these chains. Festus went home that night. Agrippa went home. He could have had dinner with his wife, who knows. Spoke about this Paul, who they've sent back to jail. Paul was saying, your life which you think is free, you are the ones in chains. You are in bondage. You are in darkness because you don't know Jesus. I would rather be living like this in chains knowing that I am truly free, knowing that I'm forgiven, set free. I have a destiny. I have a purpose in Christ. I have a new life. I have glory waiting for me one day. Hallelujah. Paul saying this is not metaphorical. This is real. You know, it reminds me of a story I heard of about a school teacher who gave our high school students an assignment. This was the assignment. Write an essay on the greatest living man. So one student decided to write about Jesus Christ. Came the day to hand it in, and as the piles of assignments were making the way to the teacher's desk, the teacher caught a glimpse of the student's title, and he saw it was about Jesus Christ, and the teacher said, you didn't read the assignment properly. The assignment is supposed to be about the greatest living man. And the student responded, I read the assignment and Jesus is alive forevermore. He is the greatest living man. But people want to refute it. There's theories out there. There are 
you know, quite a lot of theories, quite serious theories, but every single one of them have been refuted historically, evidentially, archaeologically, scientifically. This is, I'm not going to get into all of them. I'll just give you an idea. Then we've got to come into a land. There's a theory saying that Jesus fainted. It's called the swoon theory. He fainted and then he rested in the garden tomb and then, you know, he just woke up. Well, I'd like to put it to you, if you believe in the swoon theory this morning, that if you were beaten until your back was bare with those 39 whips with the claws of iron in them, till people could see your internal organs, you were made to carry your cross and you were slapped and beaten and the crown of thorns put in you. You had nails put into your hands and into your feet. You died an agonizing death in which every joint in your body would have been dislocated. And then a soldier comes just to make sure you're dead and pierces you in the side and blood and water flowed. I'd like to put it to you that you're not going to just wake up after that and say, I think I'm going to go have a barbecue on the beach with my friends. This was a resurrection where God restored his body and gave him a glorified, immortal body. Some say they went to the wrong tomb. Some say they stole the body. Some say that there was a mass hallucination. Well, I'll put it to you, Jesus appeared at one time to more than 500 people. How do you mass hallucinate more than 500 people? He appeared to people individually. He appeared to groups throughout the Bible. Then some say, oh, the disciples concocted the whole story. They just made it up. Why would anyone make up a faith that they would be killed for? Come on, somebody work with me this morning. Oh, let's just make this thing up, be rose from the dead. And Hey, we don't mind being killed. You know that every single one of those 12 disciples went through torture because they preached the resurrection. That same group, they were fearful at the death of Jesus. They all fled, remember? They all fled. No one was there. They left Jesus alone. Can you think that this fearful group could muster up this plan to somehow get his body and then start preaching that he's raised from the dead? Matthew, the author of the Gospel, Matthew, suffered martyrdom by being thrust through with a sword in Ethiopia. He believed the resurrection. He believed the resurrection. He was willing to die for it. Mark died in Alexandria, being cruelly dragged through the streets of the city. Why? Because he believed in the resurrection. Luke was hung on an olive tree in Greece. The next time you're in Greece and you eat those lovely olives, think that someone called Luke, the doctor of disciples, died hanging on an olive tree because he believed in the resurrection. James the Greater was beheaded in Jerusalem. James the Less, they say that greater and less has got to do with height, was thrown from the temple and beaten to death. So they took the short guy, put him high up, and then beat him to death and threw him off. Bartholomew was flayed alive, skinned alive, bound on a cross. While he continued to preach about the resurrection to his persecutors, Thomas, who was called the doubter, was run through with a lance in the East Indies. And Jude was shot to death with arrows. These men died martyrs' deaths because they believed in the resurrection. Acts 1 verse 3 after his suffering, he presented himself, this is Jesus, to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. The testimony about the resurrection according to the Apostle Paul, is credible. It is not unreasonable. It is not immoral. It is not crazy. It is not some kind of sales pitch. It is not bigoted. It is not narrow-minded. Paul presents credible facts, philosophically, historically, theologically, 
and pursue you. In conclusion, can I ask you today, do you know Jesus Christ personally? Have you received him as your personal Lord and Saviour? He loved you so much that he died on that cross and came back to life to save you. He could not have saved you if he did not come back to life. In fact, one well-known atheist was talking to a liberal Christian. And the liberal Christian said to the atheist, I don't believe in the miracles of the Bible and I don't believe in the resurrection. And the atheist, a British atheist, said this to the liberal Christian. Well, then I can't call you a Christian because a Christian is someone who believes in the resurrection. So if even the atheists are telling the church that a Christian is someone who believes in the resurrection. Do you remember that old song, Because He Lives? Because He Lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. The question I tried to answer this morning was, why should anyone consider it impossible that God raises the dead? Let us pray. This morning, I'm going to pray two prayers. First of all, for the believer. Maybe your faith has got a little bit cold. Maybe historically you believe, philosophically it's not a problem to you, theologically it's not a problem. Tick, 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 all those boxes tick. But personally, you've gone cold. Personally, you serve Jesus or you know about Jesus like he's not really alive, like he's not really with you. Like he doesn't really have a plan and a purpose and things have gone cold. And this morning the Lord wants to ignite within you the same power that raised Christ from the dead which will be ignited in you. If you say, Lord, I come to you today. I've gone cold. Cold towards you. I've let things slip in. Maybe bitterness, maybe unforgiveness, maybe unbelief, maybe you've been through so many disappointments over and over again. Focus on the resurrection. Focus on the resurrection. We said on Good Friday, the problem with focusing on circumstances is once our focus becomes the circumstance, we'll never make it through. But once you focus on Jesus and put Jesus in the circumstance, there'll be victory. I'm going to pray for you if you're that Christian today and say, Lord, I re-surrender to you today. I surrender again. I bow my knee again. I confess again that you are Lord. If that is you, just say, Lord, that's me today. You know my story. You know my journey. I haven't come to church to make an excuse. I've come to church to encounter the living God. And I pray that you'd reawaken my faith now. And I pray that the same spirit who raised Christ from the dead would now come and dwell in me and quicken my mortal body. I want to be alive for you, Jesus, because I know you are alive. Thank you, Jesus. Next, I'd like to pray for those who maybe wandered away from the Lord or you've never given your life to Jesus. I know we wander. Jesus will never wander from you, but we wander. Or maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. So you either want to give your life to him for the first time. You have heard some compelling proofs today from scripture and from elsewhere historically. Maybe you've got to move beyond doubt into belief. Just like those people who went to the Alps and they stopped at the cross and never got to the empty tomb. Would you move from the cross this morning? to the empty tomb and say, even if you say, Lord, help me believe, help me believe, help me believe. If you want to recommit your life to Jesus or give your life to him for the first time, would you say this prayer with me with all your heart? Dear Jesus, thank you for Easter. Thank you that you died on that cross for me publicly. Please forgive me a sinner. 
I receive you, Jesus, into my life as my Lord and Savior. I believe you died for me and rose again from the dead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I now receive you, Jesus, as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you that I am a Christian now. I am born again by the Spirit of God. Thank you that you have a plan and purpose for me on this earth, a perfect plan and purpose, and which I now receive. And thank you that you are preparing a place for me in heaven. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for what you did for me. While every eye is closed and head is bowed, if you prayed that prayer as a recommitment or for the first time, no one's looking around. This is between you and God. Would you put up your hand and say, I prayed that prayer. Let's do that now. God bless you. 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 All over this place, hands are going up. All over this place. God bless you. I see your hands. God bless you. You can put your hands down. Lord, you've seen every hand that has gone up. May that be a sign of an open heart, an open life to you. I pray now, Lord, for your salvation in their life and that you'd fill them with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Do you know what they say in the Bible? That when one person comes to the Lord, the angels in heaven rejoice. You've caused a party in heaven. Come on. <laughs> to all those who responded this morning, congratulations. If it's your first time giving your life to Jesus, this is the first day of the rest of your life. Isn't that amazing? For those who've recommitted, this is again the first day. It's a second chance. For some, it's more than a second chance. I want to just give you a challenge though. You can, that's why I say I preach for your Monday. All this you receive today, take it into tomorrow. When the enemy wants to discourage you, when people want to discourage you, remember the word of God. Speak the word of God. What do you do next as a Christian? Well, get a Bible, get the Bible app, start reading the Gospel of John. John wrote his Gospel in order that we might believe. Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Fourth book in the New Testament. And we all know it, John, so you know, not a difficult book to forget. So John, start there. Then I always say to people, if you can, give the church a year of your life. Try come every Sunday and you'll see the growth. If you can, get into a small group, a life group, or an age-appropriate group in the life of the church. It will help you grow as a Christian. God bless you. Have an awesome Easter. We're going to close with our final song, Worship Team. I search the world, but it didn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. Now every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Lord, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Well, I know this to be true, cause I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all and you still call me friend, cause the God of the mountain, hallelujah, is the God of the valley and there's not a place your mercy 
and grace will find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Yes, Lord. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I know this to be true. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn grace into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. Lord, there's nothing better than to highways you're the only one who can hallelujah hallelujah well there is nothing and no one better than the lord i pray that you have a super blessed week please do join us if you're able to, for refreshments after the service, Carol and her team have done a great job. There's cake and all sorts out there. Uh, I, I spotted whilst we were praying a bit earlier on. It all looks all very good. Let's have some great fellowship together. Now for the blessing for today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. May you have a great week filled with the power of the Spirit, knowing that we serve a risen Savior. He is risen. Amen. God bless you. Have an awesome day.